I think a lot of these stereotypes are outdated. They apply to a homeschooler that no longer exists. You're listening to Damn the Absolute, a podcast about our relationship to ideas. Produced by Eradicus. Here's your host, Jeffrey Howard. Welcome, friends, philosophers, and fellow practitioners of ideas. This is episode 10 of Damn the Absolute. Mass schooling is a relatively recent phenomenon, an experiment in education that gained steam following the Industrial Revolution, becoming increasingly widespread in the 19th century in part due to advocates like Horace Mann. Mann was a social reformer, skeptical of parents' abilities to properly educate their children to become future employees and democratic citizens. He believed that these common schools, as they were called, could remedy the lack of proper discipline found in some households. Notably, Mann homeschooled his own children outside the dictates of these common schools he advanced for other people's children. Further, he and his fellow reformers worried about the flood of diverse immigrant families that were challenging contemporary cultural and social hegemony. Mann went so far as to argue that these marginalized groups were wholly of another kind in morals and intellect. Mass schooling champions asserted that compulsory education was necessary for preventing the corruption of young children in the hands of those they deemed ill-suited to properly foster their moral and intellectual development, namely their families and respective communities. Traditional schools were to be the means of instilling a particular sense of shared American identity that would allow American democracy to function well. Now, this is not to color all mass schooling advocates as cultural chauvinists, but to highlight that what we consider traditional schooling today is in many ways informed by the notion that parents and children lack the skills required to learn outside the schooling system. Traditional schooling embraces a view that Learning best occurs when a uniform curriculum is imposed upon young minds, children being segregated according to age within rigid classroom structures. It is commonly held that becoming a successful and contributing member of a democratic society requires going through the mass schooling system. Conventional schooling's primary goal is knowledge acquisition, with everything else being secondary. Students tend to be treated as passive subjects, receptacles for the knowledge deemed necessary by their teachers, school system administrators, and other centralized educational authorities. What might a more student-centered learning environment look like? What if, instead of imposing a universal curriculum onto children, they were instead provided with the resources needed to help them achieve their own self-selected goals? What if becoming a socially and emotionally intelligent human being was the primary goal of an educational approach, rather than being supplemental to knowledge acquisition? Tirsa McQueen is an unschooling parent of four children. Following her own experiences as a teacher and her children's encounters with mass schooling, her family has embraced unschooling and gentle parenting. According to McQueen, these two philosophies go hand in hand, holding central the idea that children deserve full respect, greater autonomy, and tailored support as they learn how to thrive as young people, and eventually as adults. Despite her advocacy for self-directed learning, she acknowledges that she isn't completely opposed to schooling. It's still an option for her kids should they choose it. However, as a black parent, she is well aware of the school-to-prison pipeline, and the reality that black children are punished far more frequently and severely than other children in schooling environments. She expresses that she can't wait for traditional schools to change in order for them to become safe and nurturing places for her children. McQueen considers the criticisms lobbed at unschoolers and self-directed education advocates, suggesting that many of them are stereotypes pertaining to a type of homeschooler that doesn't really exist anymore. Unschooling and gentle parenting are difficult for some people to imagine and have their own share of difficulties, but she observes that her relationships with her own children have never been better. She also notes that the depth of her children's learning has increased dramatically as they've been able to direct time and attention toward their own goals and interests. 
some things to further consider. A century ago, the philosopher and social activist John Dewey proposed a notion of education as learning by doing, emphasizing the need for practicality and meaningful learning. What might happen if more young minds were afforded this approach, supported by family and community members as they experimented with overcoming the challenges they face in their particular social environments? In what ways might an unschooling approach to learning better prepare people to navigate the demands and problems unique to their local context? And how might unschooling better prepare children to participate in democratic living? I hope you'll contribute to the conversation. Tirsa, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So we have a tradition here at Damn the Absolute. What is a viewpoint you've held as an adult you were confident would not change that has actually shifted dramatically for you? That's a really good question. I think that my views around religion have certainly changed. I mean, I grew up with a pastor as a grandfather, and I went to evangelical Christian school, private Christian school, and I sang in the choir. And now I'm much more liberal liberal with my idea of God, and I don't go to church, and my kids would hate to go to church. <laughs> they would not like to go there. But yeah, I'm just more liberal around the idea of religion and God and spirituality than I was when I was a child. And that's something that's changed drastically. How does your family, including your grandfather, responded to that? Well, there's nothing that they can do about it. <laughs> I mean, they don't, <laughs> they, don't, they don't like a lot of the ideas that I have or the way that I have um, chosen to live my life in a lot of ways, but they are coming around to accepting it. And I'm coming around to just not caring as much what other people think about the choices that I make in life, which is incredibly liberating. Well, we'll be hopefully unpack some of that in our conversation today. We're talking about self-directed learning and unschooling. What is your own experience with education and schooling? You mentioned a little bit of it, but I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper into that. Like I said, I went to private Christian school for a while. But I ended up back at my local public school, which was interesting because the private school was predominantly white and my local school was mostly black. It was the product of white flight. The whole town was, it was a Levitt town. So if you're familiar with those, they were towns that popped up after World War II that black people weren't allowed to live in until like later in the late 60s, early 70s. And my grandparents were like one of the first black families to own a town, excuse me, own a house in the Levittown in New Jersey. Around the 80s, it was a product of white flight and the whole town just shifted from white and, and then it went to like multicultural, then it was just like black, just completely black. And like right now it's just mostly black. And I graduated from my local high school and then I attended Howard University while I was at Howard, I minored in secondary education and I tutored low income middle school students in Southeast DC, which is, is like a low income air, area. And I tutored them in math and reading. And it was there that I first started to understand how the school system wasn't really supporting black kids. I remember bringing them my own books to read because they didn't have like Harry Potter. They didn't have like update books and they wanted to read them. So I got in trouble for bringing them comic books, but they couldn't read. So they were in seventh and eighth grade and they still didn't get the basics. So I was just trying to do anything that would help them. And the school, they just didn't like that. I thought they deserved more freedom. Coincidentally, I was a student teacher myself in DC several years ago in the Northwest. Probably a little bit different situation, but definitely saw some of that going on in the school yeah. I was at. Like they just didn't, they just didn't, they weren't allowed to read the things in school that they were interested in, even in, it was an after school program. And I didn't like that. I thought they should have more freedom. And also while I was in college, I started substitute teaching in my hometown when I would go home for breaks. And it was just basically more of what I experienced in DC. The kids were apathetic about their education. And I began to formulate this idea that they were just beat down and bored. And I was like, this is not the way. I just didn't think it was the way to educate someone. I just began to get this idea in my head, like there has to be another way because this isn't working. And it was during that time 
that I decided that I didn't want to go into education as my career because of how much it depressed me. I would come home after work and I would just be sad and depressed because of the fact that I felt helpless and I couldn't really change anything. And I felt like I knew what needed to be changed, but there was just so much opposition at every turn. So I just said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And then I gradu- after I graduated Howard, I, I subbed for another year at the high school and I actually had my own class for a year because they were so understaffed. I taught music appreciation for the entire year as a substitute, and that was eye-opening. Like, I was just like, oh my goodness, there's just so many problems here. Where do we begin? What led you eventually to self-directed learning and unschooling? After Howard, I got married to my high school sweetheart. We have four children, three boys and a girl. And like, like I was saying, my experiences in the public school system My own experiences and just the experiences that I had as a teacher, as a substitute teacher and a tutor made made me to begin to start thinking about a different way, a way that maybe hadn't been considered before. But I sent my kids to school originally because as soon as I brought up unschooling or just homeschooling to my family, they were like, oh my gosh, absolutely not. It was still, (laughs) even in this day and age, there's a stigma of the homeschooled kid that is like this socially awkward kid that doesn't know how to read. And in my mind, I thought, well, there's so much technology today. So even if that did apply in the 80s, it certainly doesn't apply today. But I was still not as confident with myself as I am now. So I just sent my kids to school, you know, went along with it. And then when Sandy Hook happened, that really shook me up because my daughter was also in kindergarten. So I was very shook up by that. And then after that, we moved to Texas which is a very, I'm from New Jersey, and we moved to Texas, which is a very homeschool-friendly state. And so the idea started swirling around in my head again. Also, I wasn't near my family anymore, so their influence was not as prevalent in my life. But I still sent my kids to school there. My son had started, uh, my daughter started first grade there, my son started second grade. After the second grade for my son, where he said, no, it was third grade, excuse me, where he said, he had this experience where some kid had done something misbehaved in the classroom and every child was punished. And he thought this was like the biggest injustice that had ever occurred. And he just couldn't take it anymore. And he just said, I don't want to go to school anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. But I thought he'd get over it. Like I thought, okay, (laughs) this is what kids say. They don't like going to school. I've heard it a million times. So I just told him, like I said, okay, we can try homeschooling. You know, we can try homeschooling in the next school year. And he was like, okay, it just made him feel okay about it. And then he just went away. Well, then in the, I thought he was going to get over it. And the summertime came and I started school shopping. And he said, why are you doing that? I told you I wasn't going back to school. <laughs> so I said, oh, you were serious about that? He was like, yes. So that's when I said, okay, well, I'm going to respect what you want to do. And it's not like we didn't have the internet and plenty of resources to find out how to homeschool. So I just started doing my research, sent the email to the school. I still remember the day I sent the email to the school telling them that they wouldn't return in the next year. And it was very just it was very scary, but also very exciting. So we just started homeschooling, the regular homeschooling, like school at home, bought the curriculum, the whole nine yards. We started at the kitchen table with the books open and we felt free for the first time, like the kids felt free because they could sleep more. That was the first thing that I realized they were sleeping so much more. They needed more rest than they had been getting. They could also eat when they were hungry and use the bathroom when they needed to. So those things were definitely the the initial benefits of homeschooling. But then the school at home model still felt restrictive to us. Mm -hmm. There were still tears over math. There was still the I, you have to do this right now and no, why do I have to do it? It was still the battle back and forth. And so it didn't feel right. It felt like, well, we left school so that we wouldn't be fighting all the time. We wouldn't be having these daily struggles and we still are. So we began to naturally just start to, it was just like an organic transition from like the school at home model that we basically accepted because we had been conditioned by school to think that that's how you learn. And we just organically just started to relax. And as we did that, me and my husband observed that the kids were delving deeper into their own interest and spending a lot of time 
doing the things that they liked and the things that they were interested in. They were getting just as much out of it as they had been when we forced them to do the work. They were actually getting more out of it. They were actually spending more time researching turtles. They were actually spending more time looking up things that we had no idea that they were interested in and they had no idea that they were interested in, but now they have the time and the freedom to do it. And so the idea that they wouldn't do anything, that went right out the window because we started to observe the things that they were doing. And one day I just said it was the beginning of the next school year. I was still using the school calendar. Who knows why? But it was the next school year. And I said, what if we didn't buy curriculum? What if we just decided to do what we wanted to do and just saw where that took us? And they said, "Okay, yeah, let's do that. That's how it started. It just it wasn't I didn't even know what unschooling was. I didn't have I had never read a John Holt book or anything. I had never knew the term. It just just naturally happened. And then it was after that that I decided to, well, I need to find out if other people do this and join a community of people who do this or just, just start to understand how people naturally learn. And that's when I discovered unschooling. Homeschooling is a term most people are familiar with. How would you articulate unschooling and what, in what ways is unschooling different from homeschooling? Unschooling families are homeschoolers. We learn at home. We don't go to traditional school. It's the approach to learning that makes it different than like an eclectic homeschooler or classical homeschooler. And our style is just child-led in every way. That's not to say that we don't make suggestions or encourage the kids to take classes or read books that we think that are in line with their interests. It's just they have the right to say no. It's just a non-coercive way of learning. That's the main difference. There's many styles of homeschooling. Unschooling is a style of homeschooling. Curriculum seems to be a a key point of distinction as well between the two. A lot of other types of homeschooling will perhaps, for lack of a better term, impose a curriculum on their kids, whereas it sounds like for you and for most unschoolers, it's very much kids decide what is of interest to them and they pursue it and you provide as many resources as possible. Is that accurate? That's absolutely accurate. I often say that it's not my job to tell the kids what to do. It's my job to tell them. It's just my job to help them with what they want to do and to provide the resources and tools to help them do it. What are some of the biggest criticisms or maybe negative reactions you get from people when you talk to them about unschooling? Oh my gosh. I mean I know there are a lot. <laughs> I've heard <laughs> I've heard them all. Basically, the first one, I think the biggest one is like what about math? People get really caught up in math. So as that that is a thing like what about math? I I remember I had someone I was describing unschooling to them and they they said, "I don't think I ever would have learned multiplication if I hadn't been forced to learn it." And I was I just don't think that that's True. You know, you might not have learned it in the way that you learned it, but you probably still would have learned it just through grocery shopping and just trying to decide how many packs of jello you need to to for your family. I don't know, but you would have learned how to multiply in a natural and organic way. Another criticism is how will they learn if you don't force them? That's ridiculous because people learn. You can't stop people from learning. Human beings learn. That's what we do. We learn every single day. Try to go a day without learning. I dare you. Just try to go a day without learning something. I I, I would love someone to report back to me that they learned nothing. And they'll never make it in the real world is one of the other criticisms, which I find hilarious because they already live in the real world. So I don't know how they're not going to make it. They're making it every single day. And there's always this elusive homeschooler, unschooler that every naysayer has met that doesn't know how to read. I don't know who this kid is, but everyone's met him and he can't read. So those are the biggest criticisms that we get. Building off of that, the criticism of unschoolers not being able to adapt to the real world. I think that comes from this concern of when you, quote unquote, enter the real world, you have bosses and supervisors who, in a way, impose things onto you. You don't always get to choose what you want. What is your typical reaction or response to that? Well, no one gets to choose everything they want to do. If you thought of my kid's childhood as Disney World, everyone thinks of Disney World as this wonderful, fun place. But when you get there, it's hot. You have to wait in lines. There's a lot of things that 
happen at Disney World that you don't want to do, but it's still fun. The overall experience is considered fun. It's the same thing with unschooling. When my children learn about something, there's a lot of things that they have to do within that topic that they don't want to do. If my daughter, she loves to bake, if she's baking, there's a lot of things she doesn't want to do while she's baking. She doesn't want to necessarily clean up after she bakes, but that's a part of it. I understand what people are saying, but no one in life gets to do every single thing they want to do, even within the things they want to do. There are going to be tasks that they don't want to do or that they have to learn in order to have a fulfilling experience within that thing. I just don't think that people consider that when they say you can't do everything you want to do. Of course you can't do everything you want to do. It's part, that's part of the experience is learning the things that you are willing to do to, to, to be uncomfortable to get to the broader experience of what you do want to do. There's another criticism that gets thrown around a lot that you've alluded to, and that is socialization. There's this notion that if you unschool or homeschool, your kids are going to be improperly socialized. How do you respond to that? We socialize dogs. We don't socialize people. I r rarely lead with the fact that my kids homeschool because of this stereotype that there's the stereotype of the awkward, unsocialized homeschooler or unschooler. I've met so many people who when they just meet my the kids, they just meet our family and they talk to us and it's it's all good. And then they inevitably ask, where do they go to school? Because for some reason, people don't know how to socialize with children. They, they accuse my kids of not being socialized, but they don't know how to socialize with children without saying something about school. The only questions they have to ask them are associated with school. So they'll say, what school do they go to? Or what grade are they in? Or what's their favorite subject? All things that are related to school, they don't ever, they just aren't considering them as people. Like I said, I don't lead with the fact that they're homeschooled. And usually when people find out that they're homeschooled, they're surprised because they aren't what people generally think of as homeschoolers because they're not awkward. They do know how to talk to people. And I, in my experience, I found that unschoolers and homeschoolers in general, because they have so much experience in the world, they are able to talk to everyone, just, not just children, but adults as well. Like my son, he's 15 now. He, he's an avid chess player. And he used to go to, before COVID, unfortunately, to chess at the library. And he used to always joke that chess at the library is nine-year-olds and 90-year-olds. So he gets <laughs> to play with a nine-year-old kid and a 90-year-old man, an elderly man, and he can talk to any of them. And so they get to experience everyone because they're not segregated by age. And I think that it is only a benefit for them in the real world, quote unquote. Like my son has had already, he's had a um, job interview at the grocery store and he did phenomenally. They were extremely surprised that by the fact that he is homeschooled because he's able to speak with people. He's not intimidated by adults. He actually prefers to talk to adults. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm just not concerned about it as people seem to be. And I think that they are also living in the past. I mean, we, we spend, like, we're talking through the phone right now. I've never met you, but I just was talking to you, looking at your face through the computer. So that's how people get to know each other nowadays. And it's, it's fine. So we have those options are more available to us than they've ever been. I think a lot of these stereotypes are outdated. They apply to a homeschooler that no longer exists. Hello friends, Jeffrey here. Please go ahead, take a quick moment to click that subscribe button and rate us. It really helps us to further grow the community around Damn the Absolute. Enjoy the rest of the episode. I'm impressed when I've interacted with people who have unschooled the amount of confidence and assurance socially that most of them have had. I recall a couple of years ago when I was touring a democratic free school or an unschooling school, and I was at a table with a few other adults, a couple of them are staff there, and we were talking. And one of the teens, probably 13 or 14, just very comfortably sat down and joined the conversation. And there wasn't this typically unsure or uncomfortable early teen interaction that happens with a lot of teens I interact with 
or probably how I was when I was in a traditional school when I entered a table of adults. And I think it speaks to what you're talking about of the social and emotional intelligence that can develop when you are a kid who's interacting with people across all ages. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, the kids are now, it's, it's COVID time, it's a pandemic, and the kids are now having to adjust to doing things virtually, which that's not typically our daily life when we first became homeschoolers and unschoolers. Our whole like unschooling philosophy was education through experience. So we tried to immerse the children in museums and, like I said, trips to the library where they took classes and were in chess clubs. And we just tried to get them to out and doing things and talking to people. And it does wonders for their self-esteem and their grasp on the real world. So they are able to talk to people and not feel any type of self-consciousness about it at an earlier age. And I will say that it takes time. It was something that they grew to, especially when they were de-schooling or transitioning from being in a schooled environment to just an unschooled environment. But now at this point, it's just second nature. It's a wonderful thing to see how much they've matured. Speaking to the, the social interaction piece, what is it like when your kids interact with other kids who do attend school? How do they navigate that? Because I can imagine and I know that some kids who are in schooling environments are kind of shocked by that as well. That's, they don't generally talk about it. Like with other kids, it's adults that usually ask the schooled questions. It, with other kids, they don't ask those type of questions, not right away. They usually ask something about what, how old are you? Or, you know, what are you interested in? Do you, have you seen the latest Marvel movie? Something like that. Actually, my daughter joined the local Girl Scout troop. And when she started, there were already a bunch of homeschoolers in the troop. It was a mixed troop, schooled and homeschooled girls. And you wouldn't be able to tell which one were homeschooled and which ones were, were schooled from the outside if you just interacted with them. And not, they don't care either. The schooled kids, actually, a lot of the school kids think it was awesome prior to COVID, but they thought it was, it was awesome that my daughter did have the freedom to homeschool. They, they, a lot of them expressed the, the wish to homeschool themselves. So it's never been an issue for us with other kids. It's been more of an issue with adults than children. Unschooling seems like it corrects against a lot of shortcomings that occur in traditional educational settings too. So, but it does have its own challenges. And if you alluded to some of them, what do you find are some of the most common challenges or concerns with unschooling? I would have to ask my kids <laughs> what they <laughs> find is the biggest challenges for us. I think the most most of the challenges that they would cite would probably be due to the pandemic now because like I said they're they aren't able to live life in the way that they once did and experience the world in the way that they once did which was primarily how that was our like educational way that was like our philosophy for life was like getting out and doing things so now that they aren't able to do that I think a lot of the complaints that they would have would be the same complaints that kids that homeschooled that were in school that are now virtually learning because of the pandemic, the same complaints that they would have, um, like isolation, because they aren't able to get out and socialize and do the things that they want to do. But prior to COVID, I really don't see the issue that unschooling presents. I think that my I, my son, he, who's 15, he, he once told me that the only issue that he ever encountered was that Schooling is so much part of the popular culture. So like when you watch television and things like that, it's always someone in schools and they don't they don't ever really show anyone that represents him. So schooling is like universal where his experience is not. So that's that is one of the challenges that my my children have cited. But other than that, I asked my daughter once, what does she think she's missing out on it by not being in school? And she couldn't think of anything besides, you know, <laughs> she would, she would like to have a locker. Like she sees, like I said, she, they see it on television and they are like, oh, lockers look cool. But other than that, they've never really complained about the fact that they unschool. And also I'd like to say that I've never taken school off the table for them. Before COVID, we went and visited a local high school because my son was coming into 
the time that he would be in high school. And we did, we took a tour of the high school. At, I've always said that 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 was an option for them because this is their life and this is their education and they can do it however they see fit. But they just, they would not like to give up their freedom. So what forever pros schooling may have, they don't want to give up their freedom. So that's, that's the reason why they continue to unschool. To take a step a little bit more into the a broader, bigger picture systems viewpoint, how do you think the pandemic has impacted people's views of homeschooling and unschooling? I definitely think that having the virtual schooling has been eye-opening for a lot of people who basically thought of schooling as like an out of sight, out of mind type of situation. Like they knew the problems that schools had, but they never really thought about it until they were sitting in on their own child's class and heard how the teacher was talking or what the topics were or curriculum was. So I definitely think it's been eye-opening to people. And in another way, too, I think that people assumed a lot of things about homeschooling that they now realize aren't true, that they thought they couldn't do it. And now they realize, oh, I could do this. You know, it, it becomes way, it has become much more accessible to people than it had pre-COVID because people started doing it. So I think that those are some of the ways. And I, I'm actually grateful for COVID because of the conversation around schooling and around changing things. And I think that a lot of parents have become more active within their own child's education in that way that just that wasn't just about homework or can I help you with this project, but the real ways that starting to consider what the effects were of this and what was really going on. So I'm grateful for for that. I'm grateful for the conversation about education. And I'm, I'm hoping that this will lead to a reimagining of schools because I'm not anti-school. I, I really wish that schools benefited me and my family, but I just don't think that they are going to provide me with the service that I need, especially as a Black family. I just don't think that schools are where Black children really necessarily need to be at this point in time, especially considering the school-to-prison pipeline and the disproportionate amount of discipline that Black children receive in schools. But I'm not anti-school. I wish that they were able to provide those things. And I'm hopeful that one day that they will be able to, but I don't have time to wait for them to get together. I really just feel like if I waited, my, my kids would be graduated and they'd, we'd still be having these conversations. Presuming a lot more people got on the unschooling train or embraced more self-directed learning, what are some policy proposals you would like to see happen in the schooling system, whether that's locally in your state or on a federal level? Well, I just, when I think about this, I just think about it in a more broader sense. Because we're unschoolers and we allow our children a lot of freedom, I would love for more children to have the ability to be free. And I'm not even talking about free in ways that are not things that we've seen before. Because when I was in school, when I was like, I remember, I distinctly remember being in, in first grade, the school was right across the street from my house. And I was able to walk home from school to eat lunch. I distinctly remember the teacher saying, okay, who's going home for lunch? And I raised my hand and I walked home for lunch right across the street. And then I walked back as like a six-year-old. And I just think that we gotten too far away from that. And the freedoms that we once enjoyed as children, we no longer have. And people see children like walking to the park or riding their bike, and they want to say, like, why is this kid alone? They get afraid when I don't know when that shift happened because I was able to ride my bike and I walked to the local, to the corner store and got my mom eggs and milk when I was a very little child. So those are the type of things that I would like to see. I would like to see children have more freedom and I would like to see parents not be as afraid to let their children have freedom. Afraid. I talk to parents all the time about that. And they'll say things like, well, you know, if I do that, someone's going to call CPS on me. So I, I would love to give my child freedom, but I'm afraid of other parents. So those are the type of things that I would like to see change within the laws. So people aren't so afraid of those things. You've talked a lot about the connection between educational preferences and your parenting style. 
how would you articulate the connection between the two and what is your parenting style or parenting philosophy? Well, I'm a respectful parent. Sometimes they call it peaceful parenting or conscious parenting. And all that means is that I respect my children as people, as the human beings there are. And I don't, we don't really have like a hierarchy in our household. We think of our household as a community. So along what you were saying before about like, well, you can't just do what you want to do. That plays into that where we have, we try to make it more democratic where we all, we discuss the things that are going to be happening within the family. And for chores, for instance, we talk about chores, who's going to do what, who's responsible for what. And then it just, everyone gets a say in it. For instance, we had a chore chart that my son made and posted on the whiteboard that in our living room. And after a while, it wasn't working out anymore. So they decided that they wanted to add it a day off. So, you know, among the chores, they said, you know what, we need a day off. So they added a day off. Well, the day off was before the day that you had to do dishes. And so after a while, they said, you know what, this doesn't work because we don't want to do dishes, which was, is the most hated chore. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to do dishes the day after we had a relaxing day off. So they switched it. And so now it's dishes and then a day off. This is the type of thing that goes on in my family life where everyone is considered. And we don't just do what we want to do, but it's we try to think of each other as part of a community and all the things that we do are to the benefit of that community. And we all have a say. So that's my type of parenting style. And I really don't understand. I don't think that you could be an unschooler or like have that type of learning philosophy and not also be a respectful parent. I don't think that the style of schooling or excuse me, um, learning works well with authoritative parenting. I just don't think it does. For us, unschooling is what led us to be more thoughtful and considerate of our children in, in every way. And it's great because it relies on the relationship. We try not to do anything that will hurt the relationship, even if it's more efficient. Sometimes you're just telling somebody, do it because I told you so, is faster, but it doesn't really do anything for the relationship. So even our way is kind of slower. It takes more patience. But at the end of the day, we feel like the, the relationship is preserved. This is a two-part question. What advice do you have for young people who are interested in going down the unschooling road? And then what advice do you have for parents who are interested in going down the unschooling road? I think that the, my advice would be the same for both of them, because to me, unschooling is just how people learn after they leave school. So I consider myself an unschooler, too. It's just a lifelong learner. That's what we are. We're just lifelong learners. So I would say for anyone who is just getting into unschooling and learning about unschooling after, especially if you've been in school and been conditioned by schooling, is to take your time, de-school for as long as possible. And that de-schooling is just like the transition from school to unschooling. Just take your time de-schooling. Don't rush the process. Don't feel like you are lazy or you're doing it wrong. Or why is my child spending so much time playing video games or doing something? I think they should be doing something else. That's a schooled mindset. And you have to understand that Video games are a resource just like anything else. And you can learn from video games just like you can learn from books. So that's my advice to them is to look at everything as an opportunity. Everything is learning. It's all learning. It's all resources. It's all tools. They're all to the, to the end of learning. They're all benefiting you in some way or shape or form. And just try to get into that mindset of everything I do is learning. I think that's the hardest part for a lot of people who are new. It was difficult for me because we are conditioned to, to think of academics in a certain way. And people are only learning if they're doing certain things. But when you start to think about it, you're learning in everything you do. Anything that you do has educational value. So that would be my advice is just to take your time and start to think about everything you do, think about what you're learning by anything that you do. And for those who suddenly find themselves convinced that they want to do unschooling or gentle parenting, what books or resources would you recommend for them? Oh, I love Akila Richards' books. I always recommend her books. I also 
really, I've been reading Untigering. So I would recommend that book as well. It's a book on on gentle parenting. I love uh, Free to Learn by Peter Gray. I would definitely recommend that book. There's just a really, it's a, it's a lot of unschooling books that have come out recently. Definitely since I've started, there's been a lot more people writing books about the practice and gentle parenting and respectful parenting. And I, and I love to see it. I think it's awesome. Well, Tirsa, thank you so much for coming on the show. And hopefully it challenges some of our audience's views on what learning and education can look like. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Damn the Absolute. I hope you found our conversation worthwhile. We would love it if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that is Stitcher, iTunes, CastBox, or one of the many other options available to you. It goes a long way in helping us to build a community committed to fruitful ideas. See you next time.